rather than let them listen to our boring discussions reports. Okay, for sure. <laughs> okay. Start. It's going. It's going. All right. Good evening, everybody. This is the Enfield Planning Board, and we are meeting on July 10th at the Enfield Public Works facility and on Microsoft Teams. Um, before I'm calling the meeting to order, it is 6.32. And for those of you who haven't heard, the Weather Service has issued a tornado watch for Enfield and surrounding towns. I have no idea what um, you know what kind of warning we'll get other than on our phones. According to Alexa, they went from a warning, I mean a watch to a warning now. Oh. Just as we walked out the door, she gave us a little update. Okay. <laughs> um, if anything else happens, would you please feel free to Alexa <laughs> let, to let us know? Such no. And um I don't know if things get Harry, I'm going into one of the bays and hiding under a big truck. <laughs> what? How much room is there under? Well, there's a lot of trucks. Yeah. I think we can all fit. Did they say until what time? Until what well, last I heard was midnight. Is that still oh, wow. correct? Did they say eleven? What's today's date? Today is the eleven. Okay. Today's no, today is the tenth. Okay. So, Wonderful. So get some. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, attendance, members present. Linda Jones. I'm David Fry. Brad Rich. Tim Jennings. Mark Carhats, alternates. Bill Griffin, alternate. Um, on teams, we have Dan Kiley. And um, our staff people. Rob Taylor. Whitney Banker. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Um, Bill and Whitney will be elevated to full membership if we have to take any votes. We can't replace select board, though, right? We no. cannot. So would it only be oh, it would only be one. one. You're correct. I'm hoping John shows up. Um, in that case, Bill, would you be our elevated alternate? Get you <laughs> yeah. into the get you into things. Okay, so our first um, on the agenda, although it's number seven, uh, will be a discussion with the Heritage Commission and. They have requested a meeting with us to discuss, to inform us what they do and to try to figure out how we are going to work together on land use issues that fall within both of our uh, wheelhouses. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Since I'm a member of the Heritage Commission, I'd like to join them. Okay. I don't think there's anything voted on. What I don't think I don't think there is. I don't think there will be either. Um, who is going to be the spokesperson? That look. But Rob assured me that my slide show. There it is. Okay. okay. So. Um, and there was uh, handouts. Did everybody get a copy of their handouts? Yep. So that's yep. um, so this is sort of what we're going to do. We're going to give you a little bit of a background. We're going to talk about the difference between what the National Register of Historic Places, historic districts. There seems to be a little bit of confusion about that to sort of explain what those are. Um, talk a little bit about the very the goals that we have, the goals that you know, have been expressed in the master plan and how we can actually a lot of them we share and how we can then maybe give you some suggestions to work on them. So 
this, I hope, is sort of a bare bones presentation, nothing to decide now. It's to sort of start being able to think about ways that we can work together. And uh, it occurred to me because, as you all know, I'm on zoning board and we've you know, got we had this big layer of farm decision. There's the shed street uh, thing coming up. There are a lot of big projects that are a challenge for the town to absorb, a challenge for the character of the town. And so this seems like a good time to really start to examine what our values are and how we're going to, to deal with this. Also, because as I was looking at the master plan, it two things. One thing struck me is that in the master plan, there seem to be two sort of big thrusts. One is a request or a, you know, the community's desire to have more services, to have, you know, things that are a little bit more lively, maybe shops, maybe restaurants and things. People are, you know, obviously there's a great need across the, the state and here to have housing. And then at the same time, there's a desire to preserve Enfield's rural character. So these are two things that are not always easy to reconcile. And so it seems to me that they say this is a good moment for us to start coping with that and finding a way, finding ways forward that we can, you know, that we can, can manage that. So um, I hope, as I say, we're going to go through this fairly quickly so that we can answer questions later on. It might be more useful. Um, the Heritage Commission's uh, legal basis, and you've got it there. I'm not going to bother. Can we get the next slide? I'm not going to bother reading it to you, but and you have the text there. This was something that was started in 1963. The, the New Hampshire creates the Heritage Commissions. If you, any of you know a little bit about um, heritage preservation in the U.S., that was kind of a watershed moment. Some big things happened. They destroyed Penn Station in New York, and people started to think, wait a minute, you know, what are, what are we throwing away? What do we need to keep? So, as I say, that's in your handout. Um, I won't bother reading it to you because you can all read yourselves. And uh, I think we should go on to the next. And Meredith is going to talk a little bit about the Heritage Commission because she started it. <laughs> and she knows all about why it came about. And we'll talk about we'll talk about that. <clears throat> OK, well, uh, yeah, I feel as old as Methuselah having been with this for a very long time. I'd like to start by reading the mission statement of the Heritage Commission, which is still very relevant. The Heritage Com Enfield Heritage Commission will properly recognize, protect, and promote the historic and aesthetic resources that are significant to our community, be they natural, built, or cultural. The Commission will work cooperatively with other educational and civic organizations in fulfilling its mission. And I reread this on a regular basis because it really describes what we're all about. So for a brief history lesson, over 20 years ago, as Eva wrestled with the direction they might take to promote the mission of renovating and improving Main Street, which was pretty awful at the time. A request was made by the then town manager, uh, he was actually a part-time town manager, Steve Griffiths. Um, it was decided uh, the Main Street program could help tremendously in that effort. That's the New Hampshire Main Street, which is a program that's kind of faded into oblivion ever since. Mm -hmm. Um, Kathy LaPlante left to go for a bit much bigger job in Washington with the National Main Street Program. <clears throat> in, the, in reading the fine print of the application process for the Main Street Program, Eva noted that the towns and municipalities <clears throat> that had heritage commissions had a better chance of being accepted into the program. Um, at the 11th hour, it was January, my husband and I went around the neighborhood and we first we wrote a, a warrant article and then got the necessary signatures and it got on the town warrant that year. It passed overwhelmingly a town meeting, I think in part because it was maybe 
warrant article number 18, and everybody wanted to get out of there. <laughs> Uh, I have also put a, a, made a handout for you. I won't go into all of this, but I thought I, I was reviewing my notes. And in 2006, I attended a, a conference put on by the uh, New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. It was called Preserving Community Character. And it's still very relevant today, Preserving Community Character. And there was a section on how heritage commissions and master plans could work together. And that's in the handout. I won't go into it all there. Uh, some of the accomplishments of the- Go to the next slide. Oh. Um, uh, oh, that's 18 High Street. Funny story about that. It was a wreck. And uh, the town, April Whitaker was town manager at the time. It was reputed to be uh, one of Enfield's original schoolhouses, but it was in derelict condition. The town had taken for taxes, and they got an estimate of $6,000 to tear it down. And I went to the town manager and said, look, instead of spending $6,000 to tear it down, put it up for bid and let people, the town people bid on it. Don Roberts bid on it and bid Eleven thousand eleven hundred and eleven dollars and eleven cents. <laughs> he said eleven was his lucky number. He won the bid and proceeded to attempt to renovate it. Well, he got into the project and realized it was about to fall into the river, and his uh, estimate to restore it wasn't going to work. But he took the place apart and reused as many of the parts as possible and created a very nice living, uh, nice house, um, built from nothing really. So the town was the winner right off the bat because they saved $6,000. They got $11,111.11 in the sales money and provided another dwelling space for townspeople. Um, some of the things that the Heritage Commission has accomplished, and and that is that this is not inclusive, but I think a lot of you would be interested in the fact that Lakeside Park evolved from the Heritage Commission. That was under the natu natural resources part of our mission statement. Um, we've created a walking tour of Main Street. I don't know what has become of those little brochures, but they used to be available at Town Hall. Uh, it pointed out the various historic sites. We partnered with uh, Eva to create the signs on the, the historic signs on Main Street. We worked on the two New Hampshire DOT signs, which are really important, those historic markers at the side of the road. There are 200 and some odd of them, and there are people that drive all over the state just to read those markers. I didn't believe this until the day we were about to dedicate the one on Main Street and some guy pulled in and we had the thing covered with a, with a bunting ready to you know, unveil it. He said, well, where's the marker? I came to see it. It had already been put on the website and he, he chases down every new historic marker. So those things do contribute to historic tourism as well. Uh, we collaborated with Eva on the Greeley House. That's the little red house, which is one of the oldest houses in Enfield. I think that's the, uh, yeah, actually go to the next yeah. picture because that shows that. Yeah, there's the sign. Oh, and we went round and round and round with the state on the wording for that. It has to be very specific. Um, this is the Greeley House. Uh, we've uh, received uh, three moose plate grants. Uh, through our That's efforts. That's yeah, the Greeley House. The Greeley House was an absolute blank. Again, it was scheduled as a teardown. Um, it was in terrible condition. Eva bought it, I think it was $40,000 at foreclosure to save it. We had uh, Jim Garvin, the state architectural historian, come in and he helped us tremendously. And Paul Mursky, uh, 
also helped tremendously. He created the first working drawings for the building. Always, Paul always worked pro bono, anything he did for the town. Lakeside Park, the plan he did there was, we estimate, forty dollars or $50,000 worth of work that he did all pro bono. Um, but now, uh, <laughs> Greeley House is really a jewel of Main Street, I would say, or one of the nicer places. Uh, the, the perhaps our one of our biggest accomplishments was the National Register District, April of 2010. Yeah, to the that would be slide. Yeah, number it's four. one of the oh, okay. Why, yeah, why did put that? One of the largest uh, National Register districts in the state of New Hampshire, two uh, 193 contributing properties, meaning they are all eligible for the National Historic Register. And I don't think. Uh, nearly enough has been said about this, and yeah, we're gonna, we need to toot our horn a little more. Um, these have huge uh, pluses for certainly economic development through historic yeah. tourism. If we have, I, you know, I have the whole thing. Okay, so I will shut up and let you. Well, you know, <laughs> you're going to go talk about it, but let's no, we'll talk just, about that. Let's I, you don't want to get me wound up. <laughs> well, no, because that, that was what, what our next our next thing was. Um, so we're going to move on to our next item, which is the Historic Preservation Board meeting. Um, our next item is the Heritage Commission set up the Enfield Village Historic District. And this is where it's going to get a little bit confusing because there's the Enfield Village Historic District. And then there's the National Register of Historic Places, and they're sort of different no, things, no. even though they overlap in no, other ways. No, they're not. It's National Historic Register District. Right, but it's also now our, our historic district for the purposes of the other, of the New Hampshire, the... All right. Ah, uh, going I thought, well, uh, there's a, a little bit of confusion. Anyway, so the Nash, this is the Enfield Village Historic District. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And National Register Historic District. That's very different than the state historic. This, that's what I'm saying. Okay. That's it's not I'm, a state historic district. That's what I'm saying. They're two different things, but they're the same places. Are they not? See. I don't think we ever applied for state historic district. I thought this was a thought the, the Enfield Village Historic District. Is that not a state like this? The Enfield Center? Is that not? No, it's it different. isn't. Yeah. I thought we had. Sorry. Anyway. Yeah. Well, let's go back. So the National Register of Historic Places. These are the advantages of of having whatever of of these that. Of course, the built community pride, the building and safety codes um, make it easier to do certain things in this historic district. Um, and there are tax advantages of that as well, which we can also talk a bit a little bit later. The next slide are um, let's go to that. That is uh, slide number seven. And that is just to make some things clear because people don't quite understand that it, these are things it does not do. It doesn't mean if your house is in this or it's a, a national register that you can't paint your shutters pink if you want to paint your shutters pink. Um, I think that's all quite, quite clear. So, if there any questions about that, I think that's all quite clear. So then there is the historic district, which is the zoning overlay. That's in Enfield Center. That's okay. Enfield I thought Center. you had one down. I no, thought that was never no, done. just Enfield Center. Oh, I'm, that was I, my first. Oh dear, I'm very sorry about that. Anyway, but so I thought that this had been done into that as no. well as its own thing. All right. So the historic district, which is the state designation, which we have asked for, and you we got that was voted for on uh, the most recent town meeting is, or sorry, last year, is in Enfield Center. Now, what that historic district does, this is a state thing, this is completely different. I think that you should make that clear. 
that is done all at a local level. Any regulations or guidelines or things that happen there, things that we decide locally that we want want to do there. We can say, you know, every house there has to be painted white, if that's what we want to say, or we can not do anything at all. But that's done by us. That's not something that somebody comes in from outside and, and says that you have to do. Now, the, the what? Somebody has a question. The, can we go to that? That's number eight. Um, so the event, the advantages of the previous yeah. Okay. So the advantages of this are of the historic districts are um, pretty obvious. They tend to attract, and some of this is in the handouts that I gave you. There are better numbers for that. I didn't say. Um, they attract development. Smaller businesses prefer to be in historic districts or places where there are historic buildings because they're more adapted to smaller businesses. They're places where there's foot traffic. Younger residents, I think something like 40% of millennials or something prefer to live in historic districts. Um, it raises the property values of the area because it does you know, all these other things happen. Um, just a sort of random fact, highly rated restaurants and things all tend to be in historic districts. So these are things that are quite important and, and attractive for a town. Um, and uh, so maybe we can go into the next slide, which is uh, so this is the master plan. And this is where I say some of our our goals and the things that we can do overlap. You know, we want to encourage business while well, you know, the, the housing stock and the building stock that we have is suitable for smaller businesses. Mm. Um, one of these two, I think that we talk about constantly affordable housing and sustainable housing. What's the most affordable housing? One that's already built. What's the most sustainable housing? A building that's already built. So again, these are things where we can really work together to, to make those happen um, for you. And then I think let's have Linda talk a little bit more specifically about ways that we can collaborate. Can we go to the next slide? So um, the, the Heritage Commission is a land use board, and there are several ways, um, for example, for the planning board here, the Heritage Commission can review renovations in a historic district for, for example, like Lebanon does. Um, oh, sorry, can I just add on your handout? There's also the case law from the New Hampshire state about how um, heritage commissions <clears throat> collaborate, may collaborate with planning boards. Sorry. Like so the Heritage Commission and the Historic District Commission, which are sort of operating as one right now, not separately, <clears throat> they can provide input when the planning board or the selectmen have a project impacting a historic district or building. Um, the zoning board, we if if an, it's in a touches on issues in a historic district, we can give testimony to either how it does or does not, whatever's asked for, enhance the um, uh, the project they're asking for a variance for, um, or does it retain the spirit of the ordinance? For the selectmen, um, <clears throat> we can provide input when to, they need to develop a work program for renovation or disposing of a civic structure, like tearing down an old house. Um, and also, one that came up just yesterday to me, to my mind, is getting preservation grants. I went over to the Enfield Center townhouse to check if it's ready to be opened for um, <clears throat> old home days. 
and um, found that they had to have workmen over there putting the roof, we call them plates, the big pieces of metal back on and, and putting them, reattaching them. Mr. Muzzy had called the town to say there were four sheets that were coming up and they found a number of those. And uh, I saw water on the floor inside. So either the roof or a window is leaking. And so that is just the kind of thing that the Heritage Commission has gotten grants for. And I don't think, I don't think it would occur to the selectmen, first of all, to think to ask us if there were grants available. Um, <clears throat> and for property owners, we can be a resource to them. We can provide information and education about preservation programs. One is the historic barn program. Many barns in Enfield qualify for assistance with that. And, um, and there is a tax incentive for 10 years that goes with that. Also, we could host workshops uh, on historic renovations. And we do have one coming up in the fall. Oops, where'd she go? Oh. <laughs> um, Maybe. For, for window glazing and restoration, which any of us who live in old houses know that that's just darn useful. And there would be no, I mean, there's no cost to get the resources here. So most towns uh, that I read up on, on their, how they handle their heritage commissions, on the checklist, when someone brings in a project, there's like there's a box for wetlands and conservation commission. There's also a box for heritage. So, so we're just thinking about the fact, is there an issue here that Heritage Commission could help with? Thank you. Yeah, so um, let's just go a little bit. She said, you know, the professional resources, the, the um, Preservation Alliance gives an incredible thing in Lebanon every year and they talk, you know, teach you how, how to look at infill how to you know how to evaluate putting buildings in and the considerations to make um and i think uh you know that would be useful as i say we've got these big projects coming up if we had on the planning board people who had really looked at these things and studied these tools would make it easier to talk to the developers and and know what the issues are and what they they can handle. I'll talk to these a little bit more. Um, one of the things that about the guidelines um, that would be helpful for for to work together to set up is developers like to have those because they know then what a town is expecting. You know, um, we had I think an issue here with the with the dollar store and the fenestration, and we were. As I understand it, I didn't participate. We were told one thing was going to happen, it didn't. But if we had a very specific guidelines that said these, that this is what fenestration means here, then when you enter those discussions, you can you have a basis to start talking on, and you can also call people out when they don't when they don't come up with it because you can say, listen, you know, this is what you're supposed to do. Madeline, is that also known as form based zoning? That the same thing? I don't no, different. So. No. Different. Okay. No. No. Um, so the guidelines again. You know, we we can decide those. We can decide that maybe they only apply to you know new buildings or whatever. These are things that we we can do. As they say, we've got these big projects coming up. It might be very helpful to have those up front when somebody who wants to build here comes, and we know we've already decided what they what the parameters are. The other thing that I think is really important and and um, <clears throat> Meredith mentioned is the question of the character of the town. That's something very vague. It says in the, you know, in the in the master plan, the care, the rural character of the town. And we need to have a little bit more clear 
what that means or what our town character is. Again, that's something that the New Hampshire Cultural uh, Heritage, New Hampshire <laughs> Preservation Alliance can help us think that through and just make our parameters and make a concrete thing that we can then have that standard and we all know what it is. Because I think this is a little bit of a problem. Everybody sort of has their own idea of what Enfield is. Is it the Shakers? Is it the Mill? Or, you know, I think if we talk about that and and are proactive about it, we can do, do a much better job. We can also make guidelines for things like where, how buildings have to line up on the sidewalk or things that make it possible to harmonize and bring in new buildings without being fakey historic, but also still respecting the scale and the, the way that our town is led is out. So this is where I say this is, we could start talking, this is obviously we're not gonna decide tonight, but this is these are the sorts of issues that we can start helping you talk about. Um, and finally here on this, the last slide, Rob, is the, are these various, the one after this, um, tax incentives. One is this, the Federal Historic Preservation, which is an investment tax credit. Uh, as you see, this is for commercial and or rental residential space. So, you know, this is again, this is something, if somebody wants to do something in town and wants to do something about housing in Enfield, this is a really good reason to go with an existing structure and and with something that is in the historic district. So that is really important as we talk about these things. Again, another thing is this is a, that uh, Linda mentioned the bar. Again, these are things that can can help people. Rob knows a lot about the barn. You can use them to to do to, again create housing to to respond to some of the needs that we have in town. Anyway, that's it for us for tonight for, for, for the formal part of the presentation. If you guys have other questions, um, we're here to here to answer them. Well, thank you. That was sorry about that. <laughs> That was a very informative presentation and sitting here listening to it, I kind of wish that we had uh, heard a lot of this a couple of years ago. So um, it's very well done. Uh, open it up to board members for yeah, any questions. Question is that, how do we move forward? I mean, how do we how do we know when to get uh, the heritage folks involved when we are um, have hearings for for different development projects. Is it well, something? I, I I will give you my answer, and then perhaps Madeline can give yeah, me yeah. hers. Um, my answer is that we are very fortunate in that we have one of our members, right. Linda, who also sits on the Heritage Commission, and I would expect that as long as that relationship continues that Linda will be the major conduit between the two, between the board and the commission. Um, at some point in the future, Linda may elect to not be on one or the other or both boards, which is her prerogative. And then in that case, I think it would be um, a good idea for the Heritage Commission to look at our agendas and I, I think probably on larger issues they're not issues that are going to be discussed and decided in a single session so there would be time for them to um, approach us get their facts and come up with their position on any particular subject just as the Conservation Commission does. Yeah. Uh, they are, I guess, an equal um, equal level board. And if I'm not mistaken, their role when it comes to um, interfacing with us is strictly advisory. Is that correct? Yes. So that's my answer, Madeline. Or Meredith, what is yours? Most towns have uh, a representative on the planning board. 
from the her from if they have a heritage commission from the heritage commission. Mm -hmm. And that's how Linda wound up coming to the planning board. Okay. Um we will, you know, I, as I said, I think we're fortunate to have that relationship now, and we can certainly endeavor to um, maintain that as both boards go forward. Shirley? I was just saying, thinking going forward, even though uh, the conservation region does is able to be more uh, and to have an agenda with the planning board out, it would be nice to have the conservation and we're on the um, we only have seven seats. You know, but moving forward, maybe yeah. when there's an opportunity. Or as you choose people or people apply, that could be a priority for. Yeah. Or as you select people, it could, it could, you know, it's just one more thing that. Is there a select board? What? Is there a select board? Uh, there's there's seven. Seven. Uh, yeah, Alice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is the is the heritage um, and the um, conservation are they full full membered? Is are there any open slots in either one of those? There, the conservation is full right now. It's full. Okay. I think heritage does have an, an open <laughs> because one of our members had to resign for okay. medical. Okay. Yeah. Reasons. Okay. Is, is heritage elected or appointed? Appointed. And we usually ask, I mean, I would, I, I'm chair of the heritage. She's the one who should be <laughs> from its beginning, so I, I don't need to take over, but um, we usually ask for some kind of connective, uh, connecting factor, you know, what are your interests? In the case of the person that had to resign, she's an architectural historian, mm -hmm. uh, also has a PhD. And those things are important. When you apply for grants, they frequently want to know what the background of your members happens to be. So, um, you just don't take anybody off the street and say, how'd you like to be on the Heritage Commission? Or conservation right. for that matter. And you you have a conservation commission member on the heritage. Yes. I mean Kurt. Yeah, I mean, either uh, any other town party or entity can always have standing before the planning board. Like in a butter right. have standing. So oh. you I mean just by courtesy anyways. Okay. At a minimum. But by state law. Probably. Yeah, it's yeah, in RSA. Yeah. It's in RSA. Yeah, yeah. I'm not familiar with specifics in the RSA, but just as a minimum courtesy thing, it would should be heard as a like an any a butter would be legally heard. Mm -hmm. So you know, just follow the agenda. How would that play out? Let's say we had a a project and application in front of us. There's nothing in the zoning ordinance subdivision regulations that deal with issues like aesthetics and mm -hmm. the amount of building design fits in the neighborhood, things like that. I think you'd want to weigh in on. Um, as we're set up now, it would seem that, well, yes, you could make a pitch for the developer to voluntarily perhaps Pay attention to what you're saying. I don't. I don't. Is there a mechanism by? The, I don't think there's a mechanism no. of existing ordinances. But yeah. Why not? I mean, if the oh. if the the historic district is a zoning overlay, like there's it, no. If if it's it's listed through the. I didn't print off the website I got this from, but I think it was the National Historic District. Mm -hmm. uh, they list everything in the country. It just did the right. section. And everywhere in Enfield it says, uh, restricted address falls. We have the, the National yes. Register application lists 193 properties it, that are not, eligible. Help. And it lists the addresses, the mail yeah, yeah. addresses. Yeah, what I'm saying is currently there is no, an owner of that property can do whatever they wish. That's right. So, so there is no, so we have no say 
if they wish to cheer that building down. But this is that's right. That's correct. But yeah, that's what I'm saying. But it's my understanding is if it's a historic district that has we have requested a zoning overlay as we did in Enfield Center, then for that overlay we can make guidelines and restrictions on what happens in there. That's something that has to be done at the town level as we did with Enfield right, Center. Okay, right, but at the right. present moment, right now, right, right, at the present time, right. there is no. Right, except in Enfield except Center. Except for, en for, for three buildings in Enfield Center. Which so we haven't this, put any guidelines on. Right, yeah. and that, that is my understanding right. as well. Right. So are you, are you thinking to Ask the planning board to create a zoning overlay, historic overlay district for the building. I mean, we haven't. I mean, it it is theoretically possible, and that was, as they say, that was a warrant article that was voted on at, at town meeting. Right when we came Correct. to a couple of years about ago. it for that. So it, it's entirely theoretically possible. It's not something that we're here saying, "Hey guys, okay. let's do it." But that would answer if we did do it, then it would change, as you say, what our relationship with you know, it would be like any other zoning regulations that uh, somebody you know doing would have to have to deal with. Right. However, uh, if uh, let's use this as an example, someone wants to do something that their property owner, one of these 193 contributing properties. So they wanted to do something really outrageous to the building. I think we could serve in an educational uh, capacity to educate that property of the value of keeping the property reflecting its historic nature. Uh, we can't tell them what to do, but we can act as a uh, an educational vehicle. Right. And, you know, I don't know what sort of outrageous thing might be done, but unless it involves a site plan review or an expansion, we, we have nothing to do with it at all. Right. So, you know, serving or as. Or tearing it down, for, for instance. They're going to tear it down and put a parking lot there. That was suggested for breathing mm -hmm. And that's something that we could not. Have any regulatory input? Yeah, no, but the heritage committee. If you could, but you certainly could. advisory. We called in Jim Garvin, uh -huh. who is the estate architectural historian, and he told us uh, a lot of interesting things about the house. It was the house of the Shaker, the Shaker Miller. He wasn't a Shaker, but he operated the Shaker grain mill. Mm -hmm. there. It was a plank house, and he got really excited when he didn't know what a plank house was. Well, he did, and he got very excited about it, and we became more determined than ever that the place should be saved and renovated. And we did. Well, we, Eva and yeah. collective. I think one of the important things is the, the education for people. You know, we could also work together. We talked about in the past should we have awards for the town for people who you know somebody does something particularly nice they get the you know the heritage commission prize for whatever that if people are educated and aware of it and again this is something you can help with then maybe they would come to us or you you hear that somebody was going to tear it down or want you know realize if they knew better that gee if they fixed it up you know they'd get they'd get some tax advantages so it might be worthwhile for us to work together on some sort of educational outreach to make people aware of what what can be done and or what they might want to want to think about you know maybe they have an old house maybe it would be nice to talk to us and find out as he says it has some architectural feature that is interesting to somebody maybe they, a real estate agent would like to know that um so what what i'm what I'm hearing and what I'd like to suggest as a first step is that um, when people approach the town, uh, when they come to Rob with a project or when they come to, is it Vinny? Is that our new, our new building guy? Uh, when they come to Vinny for a building permit, um, that there be 
a checkbox for historical relevance. So well, it's on, it's on, you know, the, on the map that the that's there that's it, and there's a list of buildings that would be very easy to have that on the checkbox that somebody could say gee you know this is on the national register yeah historic places but did you know it yeah did you know yeah and then and then there there would need to be some communication from rob or vinnie that such an application exists right. and there would just be an internal memo sent to you folks saying that there's this particular house or a structure at this address and the owner is contemplating doing a b c and d um you guys take it from here yeah we can talk to them and say it's nothing binding but as they say people are yeah it's education interested um, about that and again the resources that are available, for instance, you know, what to do about windows, are aluminum windows or whatever really better, or what, what you know, they're, they're very concrete solutions to handling buildings like that, that, that we can put people in touch mm -hmm. with that can make a difference in how you restore it or make it more efficient or any of those. And as a suggestion or a fact, we have an absolute treasure in our community in Andrew Bushing, who is the field officer for the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. And Andrew has done all sorts of wonderful things for us. He also founded and is the president of Mascoma Preservation. Mm -hmm. And Mascoma Valley Preservation. And I am a board member. Tim, you have a question or comment? Yeah, I just want to understand the terminology. So, so this this area here that's marked on the map identifies the buildings that if the owner wanted to apply for twenty percent tax no, no, apply for designation as a national historic building, he could do so, right? Yes. But just because he's on eligible to apply correct none of these buildings are actually on the list or there may be at one or two i don't know uh, about you would have yeah ours is, ours ours is, is on the building. register but we're, we've been going through this with alice kennedy she has a house in the district that is one of the 190. so once they get on the that register they're, they're part of that they voluntarily then accept a lot of restrictions. No, 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 no restrictions. There are no restrictions. Look at the page of what it does not. Yeah, have. yeah. Well, but, no, I'm not. Um, there aren't any. I mean, you like, can tear it down. It just want. says you are on the National Register of Historic, Historic Places. places. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Honorific. Now, as I said, if we decided that that area, what were a area, and put the zoning overlay yeah. and said, you know, you can only paint your house white. Yes, then. But again, as I say, that's something local. That's what we decide. Um, that's not something that's imposed on us from from outside. So as I say, in the Enfield Center, we haven't put any restrictions on. We think that could obviously change. So. That's a tool if we did want to, going back to your earlier question, that that would, that would be the advantage. I would take that one little step further. If you're on, if your building is registered, this National Register of Historic Places. If the National not, Historic District. If it's within know. the district and it is contributing, it has a little C out. Right, but. Some don't contribute. George's, for instance, is not a contributing structure. Okay. But if I never, as a building owner, if I never apply to be a, on the list of national historic buildings, building, oh, yeah. buildings, building, um, I probably can't qualify for some other grants and things. If you live in the house, you can't. If it's rental or business, you can apply for that 20% federal. So if I get my house on that register, and then I do crazy things, I 
I painted psychedelic colors. I take, off all, I take off all well, the trim. All I put aluminum windows in. Yeah. I'm probably going to lose my eligibility to be on the list of historic sites. Uh, that is that is quite that that's possible. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to understand that. Yeah, it's, uh, an example it's, of that is the Anfield Center townhouse, which the town ought to be. Really a shame that it wasn't included in the buildings they studied. They studied at, was it 11 buildings, 11 places? Shred Street was one of them. Here we have a, an extremely historic building, the Enfield Center Townhouse, was Enfield's first town hall. And there it sits. They didn't even include it in the survey that they did before they began. Oh, the buildings that they studied. All this work. Uh, it is listed on the National Historic Register. And we asked them about moving the building. And they, the New Hampshire Historic Resources, which is a state agency as opposed to preservation of land, uh, told us that it would probably lose its, its, uh, its register status unless we could prove that flooding that, that it was being continually flooded and it was a necessary. So I think that's a good example of, yes, if you compromise the building in such a way, you could use your register status. Thank you. Any more questions or comments from the board? Um, I'm going to ask members of the public, if they have any questions or comments relative to this discussion. I'm just curious. I don't think I followed entirely. If I had a house that was listed, I think two was maybe asking this, um, on that map, what benefit would it be to me to register, make sure that my house was registered? Would there be any other than my own personal interest? But that said, Sharon, if going back to the tax thing, if you renovated it and used it for some other use that's not your, your personal home, yes, then you would you would be adult eligible for tax credit. Okay. They say it's <laughs> confusing all these little pieces because there's the federal, the national register, the federal, and then there's the local things. Sure. Yeah. Um, is the Heritage Commission working on um, regulation, zoning regulations for either the village or the uh, uh, Enfield Center? Well, the village, there's, you know, we don't, there is a good. A district yet that that doesn't exist, so we don't have anything to say. But no, you're right. That's what. That's not a zoning. Thing. That's but the historic. I know. I know. No, I know. Right. That's if, the national register. If that I, were I, in, no, my question: Are you or are you planning on? I yes, we talk about yeah. We we have talked to people in Enfield. Uh, I mean, Enfield Center. It's a couple years ago now. We. And we dropped that and focused on the three historic buildings because they needed help right away. Um, our intention is to get people who live in the village together and ask what they would like to see. And and it would be nice to have it, uh, a national historic district also like our Main Street is, but we wouldn't do it without the input of the people who live there and what they'd like to see. And right. We talk, we amongst ourselves have talked about guidelines for for Enfield Center. We sort of thought, you know, things for fences or you know where people can put right, solar panels. Yeah, my understanding we the town adopted that district. The three buildings. Three right. building districts okay. in Enfield Center and I was wondering if you were working on regulations to regulate those buildings. We have talked about it, but okay. we haven't. It's not a we haven't. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, could you talk a little bit about the difference? 
between guidelines that the historical commission would recommend versus zoning ordinances, which usually are developed by the planning board. And do the guidelines have to come before the entire town for a vote or just within that district as it's established? I think we talked about this around the table, starting with talking about having regulations and you know have some teeth in it and that wasn't popular and i suggested that maybe we have a list of things that we prefer because many builders or developers who come in uh, and it could just be the guy dividing his house into for to have an apartment mm -hmm. they don't always they wouldn't think twice about taking the victorian doodads around the windows and just covering the, the vinyl siding. And, uh, so I think one thing we'd all talked about was there should be a list of things that would be suggested upgrades for a historic home. But are you asking more like a, a regulatory question? You said what what are these things? Like what's the relationship between the guidelines and a zoning regulation? Is that what you're? I, yeah, um, basically because we have members of the public here yeah. and we've had this discussion a few years ago and I just want to revisit it and get it on the record and make sure that we are all on the same page. All, all, uh, Guidelines are a list we have that say, well, if you wanted to, you know, be in keeping with our historic district there, these are guidelines that that would be good. But if they were anything that was a regulation and had any type type of teeth in it, it has to go before town meeting. It has to become part of our zone. Mm -hmm. Does that answer the question? Uh, I think it does. To tell you the truth, I don't, you know, we've made, you know, this Enfield Center, you know, we, we got that exists is the zoning overlay. And to tell you the truth, I don't know exactly what the process is for those guidelines and how binding they are. I mean, I know we, we would just, you know, discuss whether, like, where you can put solar panel, where there's a million, a million different things that you could do, but I have to tell you, I'm not, I haven't looked into it enough to really say to you, this is what these mean, and that if you don't do it, what happens to you, or, you know, that's what I think is sort of your question is about that. And if, I don't know. Also, if you have, are receiving grant money for upgrading a building, as Mascoma Valley Preservation is with the end, uh, excuse me, the Grafton Center Meeting House. Uh, there is some state money and some federal money administered by the state. There are regulations there that will that will not allow us to put solar panels on the roof because that's not historic. And they don't really want to see solar panels in the yard either. They want the historic building to look historic. So, so if you've taken money from Uncle Sam, we may find more regulations. So a a grant from the state or the feds would de facto override local regs. Oh, I don't know about that. You, that's what you just said. Well, I did say that. But I mean, if I'm, if I'm not sure the answer is correct. OK, I mean, if, if, if we have in our zoning regs, which I believe we do, that anyone can put solar panels on their roof. And I'm pretty sure that's in our regs. Um, and the owner of a house. Wherever. Um, decides that. He or she wants to put solar panels because that's what needs to be done. Um, and 
it happens to be within that historic district, which at this point is only three buildings, but we hope that would be expanded. Does the um, does the grant money or the grant regulation or even the uh, the guideline does that trump our local regulation? Oh, but I'll ask like this question. Yeah. I'll ask the uh, historic I think, preservation. I mean, with the grant money, is, if the grant says you cannot do X, Y, and Z, and you say, well, I want to do that, then you don't get the money. Yeah, yeah that's true. I mean, that's get it back. Right. Oh, you do it after the fact. They come after you and charge you. They take it back. Take it back. I'll be put with interest. <laughs> okay. now, that's like, yeah. And, and they'll do it 10 years later and charge you a lot of interest. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's something that we would need to to really, and in, in, if we, you know, going forward is to and start to think about guidelines is to think about how, you know what what things are negotiable not negotiable and how those would be put into the mm -hmm. zone, you know to the zone regulations since that is an overlay like I, that's a legal question i don't know how what what in a zoning overlay i don't know how you know how the, that works to tell you quite truthfully the relay okay so but that's certainly something to explore um Again, the question of of teeth and something, you know, if something yeah. really doesn't do it, what would then what happens? I mean, and that that that's a that's a, an important issue. As I said, I think that, for instance, that's what happened with the dollar store. They sort of said they do something and then they didn't. Well, we don't have any. Uh, well, I mean, they they did technically, right. but we had, uh, you know, I mean, you know, developers like that will pull that kind of nonsense. Sure all the time sure. because they don't want windows. Um, Just an example of something where, you know, if we make also very clear, yeah. you know, you can say, well, it's not just that you have windows there, they have to look like this, you know, we set the, that's the advantage of sort of being clear about stuff. So. Right. Um, so we've gone on for an hour, which is good. And I would like, I would like to ask, one more question, only because you included it as part of your presentation, and <laughs> and and you and you promised we would talk more about it, and that is, and that is Shed Street and Laramie Farms. I put those in as things that I I don't have anything to say about them now. I'm just saying those are perhaps areas where we could collaborate we, we don't we have nothing to say about that though those were just areas that they say where we're coming in where these two worlds may be coming into you know in, into some sort of conflict um and my very rudimentary understanding of shed street is that there's a request for a proposal and you know i've been told that the heritage will sort of be part of it or you know what it looks like will be part of it i'm just saying going forward, that kind of project is an opportunity for us to start at the very beginning mm -hmm. as it gets defined to say, this is what we want, or this is how it's going to be. Or as, as they come before you with their projects, this is a time maybe for us to talk mm -hmm. about it and help you articulate as you talk to them what, what it is that your vision for the the buildings are so I don't have a we haven't we don't have a okay. plan for that okay um so anything else that you want to talk about no. okay so yeah is there any other questions we're happy I don't to see any try and answer Dan Kylie any other questions I'm all set thank you all right um so thank you Heritage Commission for coming in mm -hmm. and for your informative presentation and discussion. And I think as a board, we will look forward to working with you going forward. I'm sorry. Yeah, but I look forward to you know where to find us. And you know where to find us. Yes, exactly. I mean, I we sort of feel like we're in these two play, you know, separate worlds that we should be helping each other out. Yes, and yes. And, you know, I don't need to emphasize or I can't emphasize any stronger please be aware of 
our minutes and yeah. our agendas. Um, and, and Linda is the secret weapon. But Linda's the secret weapon. And, you know, knowing the way our board functions and communications with other boards and other parts of function functionaries in town. Um, you need to take the responsibility and come to us. We will try to reach out to you, but I don't want to guarantee it. Well, you did. I wrote in your week. That's so, true. That did happen. <laughs> it's been very agreeable. So. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you. Thank you for um, coming. And as I say, you know where to find us for questions and resources. And mm -hmm. as I say, it really useful if you want to have the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance, some of their specialists come talk about things like building placement on lots and infill and stuff like that. If they're, if they have really good programs and really good specialists and people who can talk about that sort of thing. Okay. That will help you have a vocabulary to talk to a developer. You know, yeah. To learn the, you know, learn the, the words. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, no hearings, no conceptuals, no select board report. Rob, land use administrator report. <laughs> Let's quickly give you a quick update. To Five minutes. Yeah. We had a ZBA last night. We had three applications from two different applicants. Um, CBA granted for the first applicant. Uh, variance for a repair to a retaining wall on 4A, 49, we answer with 4A, uh, but they denied a variance for a addition of a deck in the setback to the lake. Seems to be a theme that they are very rigid about uh, water quality, obviously for Mascoma Lake, it's very important. And was it within 50 lines. feet? Was in the 50 feet setback. Yeah, yeah. you're all done. Yep. So uh, then there was another variance application up on Jones Hill for a uh, like a barn storage shed on a very small lot. Mm -hmm. uh, they did get the variance of that. That was uh, <clears throat> leaving the in the side lot set back and set back to a wetland, not a, like a major wetland, it's just a wet area. And there was a pre-existing structure with a with an existing slab that they wanted to slightly expand by about 120 square feet. So they did get that. Um, we are still in the uh, appeal period for the ZBA's uh, uh, Laramie Farms variance approvals. Uh, they, that would time out about the 18th of this month. And uh, been fairly busy here. There's obviously major projects happening. Phineas, in his third week now is our new building inspector. He seems to be settling in and he's very busy with big projects, obviously Whitney Hall, public safety. It's going up for a cell tower inspection next week, uh, Dartmouth sailing. Uh, there's a lot of stuff. We finished up major operations at Mascoma Lakeside Park, the uh, LWCF grant. Uh, if you guys have been down there uh, and seen it, it's beautiful. The plantings are incredible. Um, it's a lot of watering. You talk to Patty, who's in charge of that, Patty Freed. I think it's like four hours of watering when it gets this hot every day. Mm -hmm. uh, they're pumping from the lake to be able to keep all those new plantings alive, and there's multiple waterings a day because it's so hot. Uh, it looks nice. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, highway guys are working on stuff, very busy, sidewalks, things like that. Um, it's very busy, just, just steady, steady, lots of stuff, stuff happening, a lot of paperwork flying around here. So okay. any hearings for next meeting? Yes. Yeah, you're going to have. Wow. Uh, at least a few of those, maybe three of them are voluntary mergers, so those will take no time at all. Okay. But you will be hearing a uh, site plan review for the brewery. Awesome. Good. So I've been working with uh, Brian Dignan, who's the owner of that building. And I'm excited about that. So uh, that'll be two weeks from tonight. Any questions? Good. Yep. Um, 
Do you know what, to what level they're going to rebuild Shaker Hill Road? Are they going to reclaim it? I don't think they're reclaiming. I think they're just doing a, a, like a three quarter inch over the Yeah, I really need to. Yeah, because they're, 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 they're going to seem to have been doing a lot of cross pipes, drainage work. A lot of cross pipes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they're going to throw a bunch of money into it and it'll last for another five years. Yeah, we call it, they, they're going to make it black, as, as thin a sheet of hot tops they can put on tops, about three quarter inch overlay. Uh, but the drainage work is very encouraging to me because there's been, as you guys know, if you've driven that road, especially in the winter, way too much water in the roadbed. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously in the winter, that turns to ice and it's dangerous. And it, you know, it's a section there. How do you make the decision to put three quarter inch versus, you know, re redoing the whole road? I don't think a million dollars a mile. So it's, it's just a cost thing. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, I've been involved in that. Same as a selectman, it's kind of the same kind of decision we make there. You kind of have to basically make those tough decisions to say, you know, what's going to be the best bang for our buck? What's going to buy us some time? And we had a DOT guy come in and make the presentation to us in Plainfield. And, it, and he basically showed us the economics of it. And just to basically put some lipstick on the pig, like you said, is, is the most cost economical way. I mean, they could they could grind it. They could add new shim and, and do a whole rebuild, and it's still got to crack. You know, I mean, it's I mean, obviously building it right is important. As you know, the highways were done right, right, and they last a lot longer. Of course, they see way more traffic and all that. But from the economic standpoint, just you just can't afford to do a complete rebuild of every road. So they're just basically going around. They do a a pavement quality survey where they look at every mile of state road, and then they go, "This is." It's time to do this one. Boop, they'll go out, run it, and do it. That, that road is so bad that you, like three quarters of an inch is not going to make it flat. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I mean, well, so three quarter inch is the minimum. Yeah. But you know where the wheel tracks have dipped or whatever, it'll it'll certainly be deeper there, and you know it'll add up. But okay, just curious. Sorry. Yeah. No, no problem. There was times nineties when we had it's a moment when we had the two executive counselors. And a DOT, the local division heads, uh, board of selectmen, state, uh, three or four state representatives. We were, and Jim was complaining loudly about that road. <laughs> so, yeah. Which one we got done? And the yeah. town was offered to take it. Yeah. Right. I sat in on right. it, yeah. which yeah. we don't want. Right. When I went right. to the Lebanon City Council meeting <laughs> last year for the patch thing. At the beginning of that meeting, they they had spent a hundred grand. They had hired a, a professional firm to come in and do a big analysis of all their paved roads in Lebanon. And after a hundred thousand dollars, it was kind of funny because it was basically like exactly what I just said. It's like, yeah, you could go out and rebuild all these roads, but a policy of just doing the most, uh, you know, the poorest roads first, and just basically doing what you can to buy some more time and just keep going. One, Lebanon's had to bump up their budget a little bit. They're not putting down enough. You know, they they don't have a lot of dirt roads, but it's only like four or five miles of dirt roads. It's just crazy, but they have a ton of paved roads. And so they're not spending anywhere near what they, they should. I think they spent like 300000 and That's about what Enfield spends on our pavement. And so the, the firm that they had hired said, you really should be spending about a million dollars a year on pavement. So... <laughs> okay, anything else? Oh. All right. Um, let's get on to discussion on zoning districts. Uh, I'd like to start by asking Tim to review his proposal from our previous meeting on Lakeshore, which got wiped off. Well, I, I, I purposely removed that because. I didn't want that, or I was fearing that someone would see that and think that that was something that we were zeroing in on and settling. Mm -hmm. uh, what I wanted to convey was that in my opinion, to achieve what the, I think the, the, the spirit of the meeting we attended with the, Lakefront property 
is going to take a lot of time and a lot of work to to come up with the zoning ordinance that's going to it's going to work for as many people as possible. And I just don't see where we have the time between now and March of twenty five. Yeah, to town meeting to to get that done. So, well, Mike, I agree with you. My question is, how do we go about it? Do we bring a, a subset of that group back in and form a committee? I think we do. I think we get and have the Laco Association people yeah. um, pull in some expertise that they can get. They may even be able to fund some expertise. I don't know that, but certainly doesn't seem beyond the scope of possibilities. And then uh, whatever the town can do, all that effort as well. But it, it'd be a task force. You might be able to get some help or representation from the Antrim Lakes. I'm sure we could. I mean, I would think that they would be, I don't know. I mean, I would think that they would certainly be interested in yeah. uh, a, a zone around uh, large bodies of water. Uh, with the intent of uh, perhaps having uh, different rules and regulations to protect the water. I would think that they would, and they've got expertise. Right, so probably it's probably quite possible. There's more important is this out there yeah. that we could adapt uh, yeah. so with modifications to infield specific yeah. type of thing. And they would probably know where to find those, the different um, options. But, you know, what like you're saying, it's... But everything else is the lecture. You have to re actually write write the regulations. Yeah, and, it's, and that's just not going to happen between now and January. We hold hearings and present them, and then carry the water on all the political stuff that comes up. That tries yeah, to wait right, right. And you have really you only, only have have till January. We really don't, don't even. We have, have till to December, really, because that's when we yeah. have to. Right, the public hearing. The have to have our hearing. public yeah. hearing. And, and but have... that that does not mean that we can't start right. working on it. So and... one of the things that I'm worried about is that you know we last time we talked about how big this is, right? Not just Lake, but all of the zoning that we're talking yeah. about revisiting and trying to get public input and support. And it's overwhelming in terms of the amount of work. Well, we've got to pick a few things to start working on. And um, I think that we need to have that discussion soon about, OK, what are the what are the what are the three top priorities? Maybe the lakes falls into that. Maybe we start working on it now, get New Hampshire lakes involved in the two associations. But we won't make it for March meeting, uh, obviously, but maybe 26. Yeah. But I think we need to have that. There is, if 10 things need to be done about lakes, maybe a couple of them are no brainers and a couple of them could make it onto the. Well, that's, you know, one of the things that we talked about is the uh, select board meeting. They had a draft uh, resolution of uh, septic uh, pumping and inspection. And that's something that they can do through the, uh, the health board. Yeah, uh, which does that have to still go to a hearing? I think they definitely have to have a hearing, but yes, hearing, like, yeah. oh, they, can, they can they can enact so that, that's something that 99% of the lake people are going, yeah, but we need to do that. Yes, it's going to cost each individual landowner money, but it's something that's really going to happen. So is there the manpower to get that done? By the, the inspectors? Oh, oh, you mean the um, it's a lot of inspection question. That's a topic I mean, we're gonna, that would take some time. Are we going to mandate something that's just not going to happen? I mean, is there? Well, there's a number of companies that do pumping in inspections, right? Seneca yes. has such a regulation. Okay. Yes, we've attended their meetings, uh, and we've actually had the Seneca town manager come up and meet with us. Their land use person came and met with Ed and I. Yeah. Uh, we sent Vinny down just a week or two ago when he first started here. They're doing like a follow up. It's been about one year that they since they implemented that reg. And so we're seeing how it's going. Obviously, you know, it's it, it's a learning curve for them. But we I'm sure we fully probably, intend to steal everything we can from them. If, if there's good ideas in there and if there's bad ideas, we don't we don't. Right. Do right. But, uh, you know, I think it sort of eases in with some kind of voluntary compliance 
and then there's some kind of a way to start building in some you know mandatory compliance to uh, follow through well unfortunately um there are going to be some that resist yep. and so it's going to have teeth absolutely and uh it's critical uh in terms of the water quality so we got to move forward on it but um you know again going back to the the, the forest through the trees we need to determine what are the top two or three things that we're yeah. going to work on and what's the number one which i think is the housing obviously uh that we hired resilience for right we need to we need to get that for the people yeah for uh the town vote if we can on uh, a uh, town meeting and I, I i think we'll be able to get something yeah maybe not everything that not everything we but, want, the, the, but at least yeah you know at least a big step yeah. going forward yeah. and yeah well at the very least we know I, th I think the board's pretty confident that we want to have a, a, a lakefront or a waterfront district. And I think in the new the new version of the zoning ordinance, we can identify it by name and just put the word reserved at the end of that. Mm -hmm. Just means it's it's a topic that will come up in the future and this is where the that part of it will, will live in, in the ordinance. Well. The, that would work if we were doing an entire zoning rewrite and presenting an entire document to the voters. Uh, it doesn't look like we're going to be doing that. Um, so what we have well, to. What are you basing that? On? What? What are you basing that opinion? What am I? Because <laughs> I think we can. You uh, think we can rewrite the whole thing, but. Yeah, now a lot of the sections, like in the R1, R3, R5 district, you just cut and paste out of the old ordinance and pop it in the new. Although there are some easy, a couple of, yeah, which we've talked about. Tweaks, you tweaks do that there, we, but we could do. But we, but we, we the, what I'm thinking of is we need hearings in order to get public support and to tweak based on do. what the public yeah. wants, right? We yeah. think. It's probably the right idea, but we've got to get their support or they won't vote for it. So I would like to see the, the structure of the ordinance uh, rewritten. And it would have probably several sections like this historic district we're talking about here. I could also historic infield village historic overlay district reserved. You know, it's just another section that we don't have anything to bring to the voters now. So you're talking about a new a new structure, a new format a new, to make a new structure, clean it up. New format, clean things up. That's a lot of work too. But, but yeah, it's, in, it's it's really not because the topics are the the topics are what's going to take the time. Yeah, not the format. Not the format. The the topics like parking. We need to settle on that. The building height issue, um, and but then. Those are sort of things that apply to the entire entire town. Is really, in my opinion, we need to be focusing on the village district. We want to create I that. Agree. We need to do that now, and and almost solely focus on that. I agree. So let's segue into the village district. Um, I think we learned from our public at our last meeting that including certain sections, um, specifically the Maple and May Street in the um, the village, which also includes Route 4, was something that people were not going to be happy with. And I've been giving some thought to that whole question and wanted to throw out the idea of we have a village residential district and a village mixed use and i'm thinking something like that would allow us to designate certain sections of the overall village district that the consultants have proposed as residential 
the way they are now, and they would stay that way. And the remainder would be mixed use, commercial, residential, retail, service businesses, what have you. How does that idea sit with anybody? In Main Street in Main Street currently in R1? You know, Main Street, no, Main Street is in our basically commercial. CB. CD, CD. Okay. Commercial business. Community business. Community business. But, 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 Main. But, but Main Street and Main Street is not. Yeah, the CB district goes up maybe to the post office. Okay, okay. On Maple, and that's it. Okay. And above, you know, north of that, well, you can look on the pier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's R1. Okay. Yeah. So, David, that's exactly what. I think we have now, and and I, when resilience, uh, when I act surprised at what they were suggesting the other day, it was because I had never heard that we we were going to depart from the fact that we've got a village that's mainly residential, but there there are at least two areas, the Route Four corridor and then the Main Street section, where what you just said, the mixed use commercial, was going to be encouraged. As they are now, and and so I I agree with you, but I don't think we're really changing anything by by doing that. What we're doing is not what resilience suggested. I I think there was a discussion at some point, and if I remember correctly, we did not want to add a whole lot of zoning districts. Yeah, we we yeah, and I. You know, I, I think resilience reacted to that and kind of lumped everything together. And we've heard from the public, and I think we have to back off on that. And we well, or at the very minimum, we 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 have not had a uh, um, community involvement yet for those sections, right? We haven't like we did. No, we no we we, we, we need to. We we have we have not had that. But I, I think it would behoove us, excuse me, to have a discussion that suggests, you know, where the boundary lines are, because what's now our CB district and our Route 4 district, we may want to tweak those. And I think we should get those uh, defined in our heads before we take it out to the public. So what you're saying is that the most of the suggestions slash changes from resilience would would apply to uh, the commercial residential CB area that we currently have and that the uh, other areas that fall outside of that would be what they are today. Um, Give or take. Yeah, basically, I mean, we, you know, we've got to look at the final proposal from resilience final language and there may be some things that they put in like okay in r3 you can have three right. plexes or four plexes right. and, or the generational in r5 yeah you know we you know those are things that are pretty easy to put in and hopefully not very controversial yeah not a yeah um so that that's kind of the way that i would like us to proceed um, at our last meeting. I did commit to giving resilience um, our changes on the map that they had drawn, and I backed off on that because I felt that we've got some discussion before we have them, you know, sit down and start modifying the maps. Well, since you raised that. I just sent you an email with three maps. Can, can you get those up? I have to go back to my computer and shoot. <laughs> Only two? Um, no way to. There's three PDFs. Does this machine have its own email address? It does not. This one sort of sits out. Might want to quarantine. Yeah. So this is not the first time we've been here, right? Yeah, we've been here a lot. A lot. It just doesn't make any sense for you, for Rob to run back and forth. You can't sign into your email account? 
as if you were I signing in that from earlier, home? Because I'm signed in in my office right now and there. It won't let me sign in here. It's like, whoa, you're already signed in. How about if you sign out there and then you could call his no, stuff up here? Let's go get those buttons on. Okay, okay. Either, either way. I'm not only a step ahead of you, but only one step. That's that I do have some maps that we can talk about. That's great. Um, it was my intention to talk about, and I don't have any firm um, ideas on where the boundaries between village residential and Village mixed use should be. So I am. Well, we want to create as much opportunity, right, as we can. For both residential and commercial. Right. Yeah. And, and, and to increase the density where it makes sense. Right. Wherever the heck that is. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think we want to short ourselves. Uh, but again, we got to get public support. So. Right. Um, I just want to say for the benefit of the public, we will take comments after the discussion like we did last time. Just, you want, make, just make things a lot smoother. While he's doing that, do you want to hit the notes, get that out of the way? Yeah, let's do the minutes. Good suggestion. Anybody have any questions or comments, changes on the minutes of June 26th? So I don't have any changes, but I have questions, but I'll reserve. We'll talk about them later. No sense in going now. OK. Let, later, meaning later in this meeting or, or at some, some, some other time. OK. Questions on decisions that we made that I just want to talk about. OK. But I think the notes were accurate, which is I didn't find any issues. I make a motion that we accept the minutes as written. Second. Motion made, seconded. Uh, because we're online, we'll have to do it as a roll call. Um, Linda? Aye. I vote aye. Brad? Aye. Tim? Aye. Let's see, Bill? Aye. Um, Bill Dan? Abstain. Yeah. Dan abstains. All right. Didn't even uh, we we only Perfect. elevated one person because uh, we can't replace a selectman. So there we are. Uh, minutes are accepted as written. All right, Tim, talk about your maps. I have a block on that. All right, just move that. So um, we've already talked about roughly the infield village corresponding to this green outline. We have it up there. Not sure how in depth we got about that discussion, but we have talked about that. There's no change to that. Um, the Lake District, which we're not going to move forward on, uh, some of the drawings I had the other day are reflected here, which kind of made the R1 District a little small. But for this time, we're just going to make all that, we're just going to leave all that R1 right to the water's edge and so forth. So same thing over here. Um, so just dis disregard that. Anyway, uh, assuming we wanted to stick with this, then let's see what the next map shows. Um, um, this then was. Um, let's go to the next. The next map. Route four commercial district, and this was my first attempt at trying to define that using the property lines as boundaries. So you start here four across the Canaan Town line, uh, follow the village 
boundary. But basically, you, you're incorporating all the properties that that front on Route Four, some in the back, um, right up to about where uh, just past where the water tank is and where uh, Laramie's uh, driveway would be. So I think probably you on that. Uh, yes. Uh, I think that's the. The roller rink. Yeah. <laughs> Some cemetery property and various pieces of water here. And there's only a couple places where cutting across lot lines might make sense instead of making this whole. That's the Seymour farm. Thing. Um, but really, only one, I think maybe one spot where we need to get that. So, I mean, we can adjust these, obviously, but that's what I suggested is the Route 4 corridor. And then we can take the Route 4 zoning ordinance, which is already in our zoning ordinance, the district that's there, and simplify that uh, considerably. I think a lot of it has led to a lot of confusion, doesn't really accomplish what we are hoping it would, et cetera. But basically, and I've also suggested that this is an overlay district on the village. So what that means is that all of the village regulations in terms of would apply to that district, except for the modified in the or overlay district. So anything about residential settings, if you wanted to leave your, your property in the residential state, those are the regulations you go to. If you want to turn your residential property on Route 4 into a commercial entity, and Route 4 regulations would, would address those, those issues. The village did, or the, the uh, this area in purple here, which is highlighted on the previous map, but you know, I was suggesting that's the CB or community business or uh, Main Street District. So basically all the properties that butt on Main Street that butt up to the back side of the core district, all the way down to just across the bridge here in South Main, uh, that we treat that a little differently than this commercial this year. Because here we have, we have used car lots, we have equipment dealers, we have uh, the kinds of businesses probably don't want down here. So, I don't know for sure, but I got to think these regulations may read a little different. Promoting that. They do. Yeah, so that's what my thoughts were to this point. So your purple area, I mean, that, that, that's part of it is Main Street residential area. Yeah, and a lot of these residences uh, have uh, are multifamily homes. Some of them are old Victorians cut up into several different apartments. There's a one or two single family homes along the new uh, six unit place that Calendar's built is right there. But but well, how would that be different? Than you aren't ignoring the rest of Main Street, are you? Yeah, uh, well, uh, my initial thought was, yes, I would. I would say the rest of the main street is part of the village district. It's strictly residential bounds in here. We don't want to promote businesses there. Or maybe we do, but um, that was if, my if you had a lawyer or a chiropractor, they could have an office in like one of those. Well, buildings. I think in the village, most any district, we've got a thing called home-based business. It's a whole section of mm -hmm. So it would cover that sort of thing. Okay. We're, we're not talking about the a retail establishment. I guess maybe we are, but we talk about what. So, I, I guess you got to look at the existing development pattern in the purple area. And I just don't really see the possibility of used car lot. I don't either. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of why 
that might be different or why that might require a separate district from the the part that's outlined in green um you know you could certainly say things like uh, a used car lot requires conditional use uh stuff like that but good and I, and I don't know the best way to approach this but i think the point is the kinds of businesses that that we would promote and allow out here you're not going to do that here right you're talking about the brewery the the restaurant the a small retail establishment in the lower lower level of a part of the building. Yeah, but if, I think you should be thinking about it is what do you want there versus what somebody else might put there because it's allowed. If it's allowed, there's always the opportunity for someone to do it. So if you approach it as what type of businesses and um, activity would you what does the town want to see there? I mean, does the town want to see a more gas stations, parking lots in the pur in that purple area? I think we want to see residential, high density residential, and retail establishments. Right. Or, but, you know, but right. not, not retail and, and service. Right. Because it was right. on paper, it says it right. is allowed. Right. There was no guarantee someone won't say, oh, okay. Yeah. But I don't think that we want commercial operations. In case. Right, right. So that's, that's, that's why separate. you separate. Right, You're why you separate them. Yeah. I think it makes me, I, I don't agree with following the lot lines there. They've appeared randomly, not because of cause of the land. Um, and I think it makes more sense the purpose of community business was to define where there could be community business and they wouldn't want to be so far back off the road. So I, I guess I'm not understanding what the green can do and can't do because it goes out for four. I, I don't know. Well, I, I mean, this is the large lot that was Lacoy, Lacoy owns and had uh, housing development proposals and even commercial proposals. We had. The last five, ten years, before I got here, I think there was some talk about a market basket. <laughs> yeah, a supermarket back there. Uh, that was a long time, long time ago. And I forget where the access, I think it was, it's a lot here that you could access back there. Um, Town wells, uh, royals, properties here. These these are already commercial properties. SAU office got commercial properties all the way to the town line here. You know they're already kind of in there, and, and so if um, a warehouse was proposed for back here, and was that may be a good spot for a warehouse. And there is some residential. In that green area. Oh, That's, yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, particularly along room four here. And if someone wanted to take one of those houses and tear it down and make a brand new something commercial. Our Route 4 zone, the Route 4 district, had envisioned mixed use in that in that area, certainly on the eastern side, uh, where you had residential was by right on the second floor commercial on the first floor or residential was by right on the first floor back like 600 feet from the floor. But we also did experiment with some form stuff in there. You've seen that in there. And I would say that's been, as Meredith pointed out earlier, the only real example of that doing anything was the fenestration one building on the family dollar. And it really is just fenestration on the outside, not on the yeah. inside. Yeah, so <laughs> then the village itself, the village district, again, would incorporate the entire area, shown purple, green, that was in the orange. Um, but that's where we talk about the infill development issues or possibilities. You know, being able to subdivide a lot into 
whatever size lot makes sense as long as the house had the right setbacks. Limitation on the number of amount of permeable surfaces, you know, things like that will self limit a lot of what can be built. Any of these lots are cut up in small, allowing uh, any home in here to, to turn into an apartment structure. Uh, some big homes that several of them that you see right now that clearly the owners are having struggle to maintain. Maybe the best way for them to invest money in those is, is if they have two, three or four apartments cut in. I don't even think you would need an ADU provision in this section. It's just because it wouldn't meet the qualifications. Well, um, you have to have it by state law. Well, I, I, I know you'd have to have it. You wouldn't have to have it written into the section here because you can already do an ADU. But there's nothing preventing you from it adding an apartment into the public on your home or whatever, other than the fact that we want to make sure that, that you know, all the, they were talking about the character of the neighborhood, and, you know, the frontage, um, you look down the road and say, well, it's going to be 20 feet, but conditional use says that if every other house on the property is, is 10 feet, then okay, then your house should probably be 10, so you can have lots of, and, and that's what's going to take a lot of time to go through. And, and this alone, uh, even if we just took the, the group four district, left it alone, didn't even touch it this year, or the CB district, uh, the village part of this is going to take a lot of time to walk through all of those little details. So to be satisfied the master plan, you know, we talked about promoting housing. Where we have water and sewer, higher density housing, how are we going to do that so that it looks nice at the end of the day? We don't cause harm to the to, to neighbor. We don't want to lower property values. Yeah. Back on a couple more slides. Yeah, so there, I, I didn't try to draw the ball on the same map, but basically did talk about the village being Connell Road to Shaker Hill and uh, coming down. So Livingstone Lodge, Livingstone Lodge, skipping over here to Lake Street, Stevens and all those guys and uh, include the Laramie thing because they're already there. May, May, well, all of that's in the village. So you're right, direct regulations for, uh, primarily about housing here. And essentially said, no commercial uses other than the home base business thing. And then your room four overlay shows you where you can have commercial businesses. But that's not a departure really from what we already have. Defined it a little bit. I don't know where to go from there. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Can you go back to the next slide? Yeah. Why would you not want to extend the purple area across Route 4? where you've got things like uh, a post office, which certainly seems to fit in the context of other businesses and service residential, um, maybe the school, maybe the um, our community building, and maybe on up to uh, Baltic with Mickey's or Rosado's, as it's now called. Why? Why would we not want to do that? <laughs> well, if you if you walk up Maple Street from Room Four, you got Hewitt House on your right, which is a multi-unit apartment building with 
Ann's place, fucked around the corner. Right. You know, is that a halfway house or something like that? On your left, you've got Jake's. Jake's. You've got mm-hmm. a substation. You've got the post office. And then there's a multi unit apartment building on the right across the post office. All of that is fairly new construction, except for Hewitt, which is on the National Register historic place in Green. Um, and that's approved. That was originally approved as nine suites, mixed use. It could have been a lawyer's office or something and it like has that. Been. It was a real estate office. Yep. For a long time. Yep. And so, now it's pretty much exclusively residential. Yeah. Um, it just felt like why bisect the Route Four corridor with a different zoning district when everything in there kind of feels like everything else in the Route Four corridor. Whereas if you go down Main Street, you're in a row of large homes. You were originally built as homes, and then and then several multifamily homes that are really old. Um, there's not a lot of new. There, there's the uh, the bank, police station, city halls getting the facelift, obviously. And I don't know. I just felt like it felt more to me like part of Route Four than it did in the Main Street. Well, what about expanding it to I don't know what the compass bearing would be, but just Lower down towards Bell Street, Stevens, I think Stevens Street or something, mm-hmm. Shed Street, sort of that, heading towards the Pan Circle area. And it's a lot of residential there. I mean, the, well, you know, but, but we didn't want to promote restaurants and uh, retail establishments on Stevens Street. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, that's the, that's the other thing, too, is what are we... What do we want in the village district? Restaurant? Okay. Uh, house. Uh, brewery. A uh, brewery. <laughs> re- re- some retail. Some retail. You had a number of places come and go. Some uh, there's the farm girl finds. She's got a farm girl finds. Yeah. yeah. On Main Street. Yep. Yeah. What, what did we say we, we would allow? On the Shed Street property, it's those two lots. Um, Eight acre. I mean, we, we didn't we say more than just housing? I think you can do some other things, but I think we could. Too. I think we were certainly thinking about housing there. Oh, I, I know we're thinking about housing, but I, my point okay. is that One of the it might be a, a multi use area. Yeah, like, you know, I really it, want that. What? Uh, what did the ranks? What do we recruit? Or do we adopt in the zoning? But there's that section. Can Can you call it up on your computer? Yeah. Somebody. Yeah, if we get my computer back on. I think you'll probably be best at paper on this. I don't believe we put any restriction on it, David. That's why it was set up as it is, as just two lots. That's kind of what I thought is you could do, yeah. a, you know, do, do yeah. a lot of things. And when the select board chose a developer, um, that would sort of be the, um, the guiding factor is, you know, does this look like it fits and will right. it work for the town? It could be it could be senior housing. It could be whatever. It could be mixed use housing. Yeah. What do you mean by mixed use housing? Mixed use. You could have some a small retail establishment on say a first floor and housing above it. Um, why would anybody want to do that on Shed Street? You know, why not? not the point. I understand it's not the point, but I, I think what I'm what I'm getting at is you're in a residential district of town. There's nothing else around that's anything other than residences. And you got home occupations, private yard sales, accessory uses. Um, I don't see anything in there about mixed use. 
Oh, Not much though. No. <laughs> so I mean that we we own that lot and we had actually looked at that site as a possible uh, public safety location. And I think it was agreed by most people that just wasn't a good use of that lot to put fire trucks and police cars down there. Because that isn't it's a residential neighborhood. You know, so say it it it, uh, it falls within what the planning board is generally agreed for trying to do is promote housing for that lot to be housing. But I don't think we wanted to restrict it. So if somebody wanted yeah. to put in, you know, 16 units, uh, housing units and a coffee shop that's right next to the rail trail, mm -hmm. if they if a developer wanted to do that, we didn't want to prevent them from doing it. Exactly. I think we aren't really in the language here to be able What's that? I said, I don't think the language is really good for that right here. No, it's not. Yeah. That. I don't see this. And whole occupation. So you got your lawyer's office and someone's running a little phone business out of this apartment. Yeah. So they say residential. I'm saying. And a coffee shop. That means people are going to drive over there, go to the coffee shop in the middle of a residential that you can. And we want that coffee shop downtown. Yeah, for sure. We're on route four. Uh, the fire station is going to become available. Fire department moves out. There's another building just like Chef Street where we say any sort of residential thing you want to propose there, we want to hear about it. But don't don't propose a. a an Irving fuel yard there. No. Or an auto body paint shop. Or an auto body no, paint shop. those are not appropriate, but it being right next to the rail trail, why would a bicycle rental shop not be appropriate? All right. I think, yeah, I think, I think the point is <laughs> you could say in the future ordinance, conditional use permit. Where you guys get to sort of look at it and say, is this site and this use appropriate here? Right? Yeah. Some things, like Linda just said, probably aren't appropriate. I think that's the way to go with it. I mean, I think there's. So conditional use really like, gives you a lot of flexibility. It does. Yeah. Right. I like that. It's, it's a great plan, so. Um, and obviously the neighborhood gets to weigh in because there's. CUP is going to be a butter's notices and the neighborhood comes in and like we would love a coffee shop there. I mean, if they were something like, but if they're like low impact commercial activity and then in the PU do PU do you you sort of get out what's going to be low impact versus excessive too much impact. Well, um, you know, something along those lines. So right, with the, I mean, just just saying the fire station might be a landscaping business because you've got the building there for the equipment already. Might be. But that's not that's not what we want to propose or promote there. We well, want to promote the building to be taken down and converted to housing. For sure. I agree with that. But we just we just heard an hour of saying why do you want to tear all the buildings down? Because that one's ugly. <laughs> that was a no. I'm what sorry. Beauties in the eye of the beholder. You know, <laughs> you can't have it both ways. <laughs> it's 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 I think it's also a contamination. So, I mean, clearly that's. I don't think the fire station is. You'd, you'd want it to our town and, and yeah. resident, residents put up of some sort. I mean, let, let, let's look at the ambulance building. Same thing. Tear it down. That's, that's got historic. Uh, no, give it back to the person. state. <laughs> <laughs> your let the state it. have it. They want it so badly. Yeah, no. Where did, where did I put Evo Street? I, I don't think it's on in my purple area maybe it should have been no it's not so yeah so maybe that should be purple. both sides or just one so, i mean we 
we got to decide at some point. So good question. Well, at least we can decide that. Well, I, think part of it. I think this is a great start. I yeah, think. it, it is. really. Uh, do, you, do you guys want to keep going for another 15 or so? Well, we need to do a couple public conference. That's true, public. too. OK, let's say it's time for public comments. Um, Sharon, you had your hand up first. Oh, I love what you did. OK, I love this second proposal. It's much better than the idea of taking Bay and Naples to a commercial district. I mean, to a village district back to the Canyon Temple Market. That was crazy. Um, that was the original proposal that the consultants had. Um, and so, but I have just a couple points to make, but I'm going to do a better job if I just stand at this map and show you. One of the things I want you to consider. Um, I live on Maple Street. I'm Sharon Bofay, for those of you who may not know me. Um, OK. If you look at this, look at the. Look at the places that have to access Route 4. And part of what I'm worried about along here is if we have large, if we have zoning that allows large buildings, say a large apartment building, and depending on how large it is, how many apartments it is, my interest is right here at this intersection with Maple and May Street. You have about 64 houses up in this section right here. I counted them one day, but all the way back to the Canaan Town line. Our only egress, unless we want to go a back way to Hanover, over, I think it's a dirt road, our only egress and ingress to Route 4 is right here. If you make this more of a commercial district, then is it residential now where the post office is? What it's, is it? It's commercial. Okay, it's commercial, but I think it's only commercial about two, I think you had said, um, Rob, 250 feet 350. back. 350 yep. feet back. So, I suggest keep the 350 feet back. Don't open it up more because if there are huge buildings in there, however many apartments they have, however many cars they have, we can't get to out to Route 4 now. And people talk about, oh, well, there's going to be a roundabout. Well, I've been hearing that talk going on for a long time. And in reality, I know with the state that it takes at least a couple of years for anything like that to become a project and then it takes another year for it to be built so i'm just like you're from a safety feature if a fire truck has to get through there or something happens up here we have to get out and there's a lot of cars from a commercial business apartments here residential trying to get out we're stuck we have no place else to go so that I would suggest is a bad plan for those of us who live up in that area. Um, it it's not so bad. I think is this what well, room? It's class six room. Yeah. Oh, yeah. where is where is Flanders? Aren't Flanders? Right there. Yeah, I don't know if you know if that happens to Flanders Street as much here. But if this Laramie Farms is built, we're already going to have a mess trying to get through Route Four to get out to Lebanon. Please do not plan for something. Where, where, where would you draw the line? I would just, I don't know exactly where I would draw the line, but a lot closer. So somebody can't, if the post office uh, is ever sold, somebody can't put a big building there. Or if Hewitt House something is sold, somebody can't put a big building there. You know, the buildings that are there now are okay. Um, who is it? Pellerin has an apartment building right here that is about six apartments, I think. Four, if, four maybe. Yeah. If he wanted to, he could be a, put a big honking building there. There again, this is rife. If you open this up, this is rife for problems for 64 of us. So, but by saying that, you restrict the opportunity for for high density housing. You also restrict the opportunity for me to get into and out of my house safely every single day, multiple trips a day, me and 64 other families who have to get to work, 
who have to get to school were already cut off from Enfield. Just trying to get just to try to get through this intersection is a nightmare. And the fact, no offense to Ed, but the fact that Ed even put this sign here, you can't even see traffic coming from this way. The town sign that he put, he blocked visibility yep. unless you sit in a big high car. You know, it's a mess. And I live there. I go through there every mm -hmm. single day. I've lived there for 28 years. So I know you want what you want, density. Well, I'm not worried about just you. I'm worried that is the same true, right, for every other street on Route 4, right, I in, in both directions. No, to take your point, yeah, right? If you expand that, then what are we even doing? What you have to look at, okay, so this is Anderson Hill, yes. is it? Anderson Hill might have the same problem, but I don't know if there's as many units up in Anderson Hill as there are up in here. Um, I don't know with Anderson Hill, can any other egress be built, you know, to give them something someplace else? I don't think that there's any other egress that can be built off of here. So you have to, I can only tell you my experience on this road. No, I understand what you're saying, but I am sure other residents in other parts of, of uh, that Route 4 quarter are going to say the exact same thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you have to talk to them and right. they have to talk to you. Right, so I'm just worried that we're trying to increase the the density, obviously, uh, for for uh, the, because we're in such a state. Um, I don't know. What we right. I, mean, I think originally Route Four A, Route Four intersection. Um, yeah. Most most. I mean, it's just the fact of life of Route Four. Any road that intersects Route Four is an issue, right. either because of the alignment, the sight lines. Um, all the traffic. But is it an issue for residential areas to access that road to get in and out every single day? I don't know. I mean, that's well, something for you guys. That's your job to look at. Um, truthfully, when I come into Enfield, what I look at is what's all along here. If I thought of development in Enfield, you know, a lot of these people probably don't want to sell their properties to developers. But these parcels along here, there's great site visibility and for most of that. And um, there aren't housing developments that are trying to get out to Route 4. There aren't housing developments on either side of that. I mean, this looks like a little bit of something. Um, so I'm just saying, you've got density here and please don't make it worse to be able to get out there. Um, and I just, Hold on one second, and I'm just about done, and I appreciate uh, what you're saying. What I, the other thing that I really caution you about is if, look at the master plan. The master plan talks about what people want, the vision for downtown Enfield. What they really talked about was mixed use, yes, but they talked about businesses that people want to hang out at and go to and sit at you know, restaurants and shops, you know, where you could purchase things and and walkable. And that's a lovely vision. And I really liked that. But if you allow too many apartments there, you're a very small space. You're going to squeeze out any commercial possibility you have. So therefore, put your apartments, look at Shed Street, you know, look at um, where the ambulance building is. Don't think about businesses in those areas. Think about businesses downtown. Think about apartments in those areas because those are already residential areas. Um, so I think, uh, and my other question is for, this is my last one. If Are you changing this from residential one in this plan, Tim? Well, the, the, so residential one where there's town and water and sewer really is residential 0.25. So you can have a, a home on a quarter acre lot on just about all of May and Maple Street. Right. Are you changing it to the um, what the consultants suggested as far as no frontage and, um, you know, houses that can be up to five 
stories high? No, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't know where they got that idea. We, we, and we haven't even discussed how New Hampshire the latest um, yeah. draft from the consultants yet. So, I mean, I got pages of mock up So, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I think what we were talking about, and, and you guys weigh in here if I'm mischaracterizing, is, is, uh, um, trying to think of, of Maple Street. As you go up a little further, there's, there's some large fields to the right. I think, uh, Earl Ford owns them. Oh, um, if some water up there. What, well, yeah, they're wet. So there's lots of natural hindrances to not being able to build there. Right. Uh, but there are some some sections that are in upland soils, and and so what could be go, what could be put there? Um, a, a duplex, a, a, a triplex, single family home, just whatever people might want to build there. I, I think is is generally the idea. Um, you've got a large lot in the uh, that uh, Bill Warren owns right. right behind you. It's wetland, which is mostly wetland. So lots of natural hindrances again to what could be put there. There is water all through here. Yeah. And yeah. Um, what is going to happen probably with Laramie Farms when they develop all of that water. There's, it's all wetland coming down that hill, and it all feeds. Our property is this one right here. This whole corridor is a, a big wetland, and the wetland goes over to this side of Maple yeah. Street, mm -hmm. and it comes off of Moose Mountain, where Laramie Farms is going to be. Right, and so. What? What I would personally like to see is that the zoning regulations allow a property owner to develop what part of their land is developing right. and not be bound by an arbitrary square footage or uh, acreage. In other words, if, if you've got enough room, you've got town water and sewer, and you've got enough room on a lot that's mostly wet, but you can build a two unit apartment building um, with the driveway and a couple of accessory uses and whatnot, and all your hookups, and you're not touching the wetland, then by all means, go ahead and do that. Um, setbacks to the property owners to your all around you, 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 you can you can meet those fine. Um, and then we've talked about having a, a, a limitation on permeable, impermeable services. You don't put too much asphalt down and have water running off to your neighbors. It's those kind of constraints, I think, will will naturally limit what can be built in most of those those lots up there. There are other areas in town. I go down South Main Street, Great Lane. It's a big field there. Um, a lot of potential for development there, if the owner wanted to do that, but he may never want to do that. And there again, I think there was something that was said about the character. We were talking about the character. I really think you guys have to think about, you're going to think about spots where a building could go, an apartment building. Apartment building, unless it's just two levels, is going to be out of the character of all of the houses. Great Lane, if you look at all of those houses, they're two level high they have nice lawns they're not going to want to look at a big apartment though they smack dab in the middle of the only field that they have it's probably so, why they wouldn't sell the land I, yeah you know yeah. i i said enough but i thank you for listening to me and i thank you for considering and i just implore you please don't lock us in from a safety perspective and just getting in and out of our property like you say today so and and for the other 64 residents okay. who couldn't be here. Thank you. And I just wanted to add that um about the when we're talking about septic systems, that the state just um the governor just signed a bill to regarding septic systems on lakes where it had to do with selling the property and uh people are bound to have to um get it inspected. Yeah. Pardon? If you sell your property on the lake, you have to get it inspected. 
I think this is a little more, more de developed. People feel they're allowing people to do their own septic system and then have it inspected. You have to read it. Yeah, so yeah. It went back and forth and it's just signed by the governor. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So I just read it. At the transfer of the property, right? If you're selling, that's yeah. what triggers it, I think. Um, Other states have that. I, that's how they catch yeah, it. Yeah, that's there already, right? I, I don't think so. Not in New Hampshire. Well, I, well, anyway, check it out. Yeah, yeah. Because I was reading it and had okay. different options. You know, I was surprised about letting the other property owners build their own. Yeah. So, I, I don't, I can't believe that that would be allowed. It's what it's one four oh seven or something. Has built one four oh fourteen oh seven. It's um it was in the citizen. I believe there was they brought it's up an issue the, about uh, if you own your own house from the state. The you can do your own electric. You can do your own plumbing. Why can't you do your own septic system? I own an excavator. I yeah. think that's what came into play with that. Yeah. As long as you follow the state regs and it gets inspected. Correct. You just can't go put one in. It's, it's got to meet all the requirements. Yeah. That would make sense. And you get it inspected and either it passes or it doesn't pass. Just like if you had a contract, commercial contract. Yeah. yeah. Any other comments? Rex yeah. Brown, 51 May Street. I spend a lot of time outside. Last summer, up in Canaan, in Hanover, I believe, at least 15 trucks a day of logs came out. Uh, then another 12 logs of every other day came out of chips. Okay, all this wear and tear on our road. We have a doggy daycare, which is zoning in Canaan, that comes up and there's at least 40 people with dogs, give or take. Uh, I notice going by every day. And I just heard today that Canaan District 2 permits to build houses on some of that uh, log land up there. I only heard this through a rumor. So out of that 900 acres, supposedly they logged last year, how many houses are, are they going to allow to go up that road? And how, when are we going to get an updated road because of all the extra traffic? <laughs> um, I, right. I, I can't answer your question I'm just throwing it out because it's Canaan. Thought. Right, but the point but is, I, I get the point is in that road. So what Canaan does is Affects appropriate right. to consider. And Buffet just said about the number of cars coming out. OK, automatically now, here's an extra four cars when these two houses are built. We're guessing. Mm -hmm. And well, if, if a if a large development goes in there, um, Canaan would be obligated to call it a development of regional impact, in which case the town of Enfield becomes a party. We get to weigh in, we get to say, hey, this is gonna cause A, B, and C, and D problems coming down into our territory, and we're gonna need some impact fees to to do something to mitigate it, or we're just going to object to it entirely, or whatever. We got one bridge at the end of Bay Street. That sucker goes out, we're all screwed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I think Anderson at the end of Brown Street, we make a quick dash through the woods to get to Anderson to get out of there if we had to, right? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, but thank you. It's just a thought. Okay. Yeah. Just one, one thing. I talked to the guy. I talked to a zoning guy at the state, and he was telling me in 2002, there was this big study about Route 4 traffic flow, and it had all these recommendations. And he goes, well, I don't know how many of those got implemented, but they're supposed to be center left turn lanes. And I'm like, oh, well, isn't that interesting? There's no center left turn lanes anywhere, you know. And I was just saying, you know, if they build Laramie Farms and don't do something, we're going to be stacked up back to the interstate trying to get through town. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I just think it's interesting that there was this whole study and nothing apparently came from it, you know. So here we are now with even tighter issues because it wasn't addressed back in the day. So 
I just think we need to look at both what the now situation is and in the future. So if Canaan, for instance, does put a giant something, you know, that we think about that now and we put in Laramie Farms, we think about how is traffic going to move? Can room four be white? You know, the, I've heard all kinds of discussion that there's no room to widen. I mean, we, you know, we we do as a town try to look ahead and look at the consequences and try to anticipate the unintended ones. But in relation to Route 4, we have nothing to do with that because the state is going to do what the state wants to do. And whether they do it this year or next year or at the end of the current 10 year plan or in the 10 year plan for 50 years out, we have no idea. And it's it's kind of out of our out of our hands. Um, wow, but if we put 400 apartments in and there's no way to turn left, and that seems like a big deal. Yeah, but, but unfortunately, the state has already given them an access permit from a previous developer. Who? Who what? Who's the the, the, the Iron, Iron Man no, or whatever it was? Expired. Did it expire? Yes, yeah. and and it was on to Maple Street. It wasn't on the roof floor. And it was a different project too. So. Uh, different owners, different project. Rob, can you can you fill us in on the status of their? So they're I think they're working with the state to try to get a permit. That's that was the big stumbling block, as we know, with the Bob Lacroix. Well, the state was was going to require attorney there. There was no room at all for. Yeah, I I I don't know why I thought Laramie already had worked out their access because they know the, some, the original de benedetto one had say that again dan the original de benedetto one had gotten an access permit to come down the water tower road how could we give permission for 400 units if we don't even know how traffic's going to move in and out of it well oh, they, permission for a height uh, restriction that, David, we really can't yeah. talk about the project. Yeah, okay, yeah. you're right. Thank you. There is no application on the on the table. Okay, we got sidetracked. Thank you. Rob, you're gonna kill us slump. No, we did a little bit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, David. <laughs> David Fay Maple Street. Um we spent a lot of money putting sewer down to move forward with the promise or anticipation that probably not the promise that, that there'd be a lot of business development mixed um, business and residential on uh, along the strip, uh, or, or strip uh, between, um, yeah, between Main Street, Jinx, um, et cetera, uh, and uh, um, the, the uh, uh, school administrative building. There's been minimal development along that corridor. And I would urge you to try and figure out how to get more density along that corridor before you go elsewhere. This. Okay. Any other comments from the public? Any other business that board members wish to discuss? Well, uh, yes. If we're if we're going to move ahead with this, um, we need a schedule by which we have to have everything drafted. And I think it's going to be a lot sooner than what. We've been talking about expecting a project kit. Yes. Um, we're going to have some listening sessions. Uh, we obviously have to have the legal hearings at the tail end of all this. Uh, can we back up from those? I think you're going to find that we've only got about maybe a couple of months yet. That's about right. So, 
I'm really disappointed that we're in this provision. Started on the planning board uh, two and a half years ago. We're going to rewrite the zoning ordinance starting then. And we're, we're not anywhere near. I was hoping we'd be. So if we're going to get anything done, we've got to have a, a focus group that meets outside this meeting of work on things. Saturday jam session or an evening, several evenings is, have got to be devoted to this. So we're not going to make it. I'd like, uh, I think it was Brett, you had sort of said to come up with sort of your top five, ten, whatever you want it to be. Three. He said two or three. Okay. I'm expanding it for this year. But David and I are going to be going to a meeting a week or two to start learning about Hop 2, which is another round of Hop grants that are going to be available for municipalities with a priority or preference given to Hop 1 recipients. Housing focused? Yes. Yes. And that's help us. this one, they don't want us to apply for less than 100,000. That's what the housing people have told us. The problem is that if we hire a consultant and if it's housing focused, we really can't do all the other stuff that we want to do, right? Because there's a lot to be done. And even if we were to hire a, a company like, like Resilience to help us write and take a more active role in, in writing it, it still requires the people around this table and the public, public. To, 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 I mean, it's huge. And it just takes, it just takes a phenomenal amount of time and effort, even with a big consultant. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm, frankly, and it's not Brazilian's fault. I don't want to say yeah, that. It was a bad. But I just don't, I don't, I'm not happy with what we've done with them, the work product. I mean, I know we haven't gotten the final work product, but I have a feeling what it's going to look like. And at the end of the day, it's really not. It's more designed to take a, 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 a well-functioning, solid ordinance and tweak it to enable housing. It's not designed to rewrite a zoning ordinance. Absolutely, because the money at the state is all housing focused because there's a crisis from the state. Yeah. So, so you know, if, if we wanted to spend money, for example, uh, on the lakeshore, that really doesn't count because we're not increasing the housing. No, right. Well, that, that grant. I mean, it's a housing opportunity grant. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's Doesn't, that, that's the prime. That is the sole function right. of that grant. And I'm just going to the realization of what that means. It's, so I'm not yeah. sure that it would help us. Right. Well, yeah. it's like we said earlier, but the the, the uh, district, know. the heritage district, if you apply for a grant that says you can't do X, Y, and Z, you don't get the money. Right. 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 So this grant was housing. Yeah, well, we need a grant that says, okay, you re to rewrite your zoning. Because the zoning needs a lot of, a lot of, I mean, the, the format needs to be changed to Tim's point. There, there's many, many different uh, parts of the zoning that need to be rewritten. We all agree right. that, that need to be changed. We all agree. We talk about it all the time. But we really haven't done any of that work because it falls outside of the hop grant. I, I'm not sure another hop grant is going to help us. I guess it depends on how far the hop grant can be stretched. And, you know, when we did the phase one hop grant, we did talk about problems with our zoning ordinance. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And the need to clarify. And we tried to bring in the fact that, you know, you've got housing, but you need supporting infrastructure, you need businesses, yep. you need transportation. And I we, think that's how we got to the point where we said we can do a little bit more than just housing because they're all interrelated. Yep. 
and you know it it just a lot of it depends on how far the grantee grantors are willing to let us stretch it yeah but the consultant's gonna do what look at what the grant purpose is and they're not going to step too far outside those bounds because their job is on the line their reputation and I, I would disagree because if we can get those things written into the grant, into the application, and then emphasize to our consultant whether it is resilience or place sets from New Zealand or anybody else, um, that this is the scope of what we are doing, then I. I, I think we're well, not going to have the problem I that we have now. I think it's worth asking them, right? I think you're honest with them and say, look, this is what we need. Yeah. How far can we stretch it? But we really need somebody that can take a section of our zoning, rewrite it, and present it to us one paragraph at a time yeah. or one section at a time and so that we can make some forward progress. We don't feel like... I won't speak for you. We I don't feel like that we've made a tremendous amount of, of progress. I think we've learned a lot. We yeah. have. We've learned a lot, but we we were it was like the master plan. We we're floundering a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're in the floundering stage. And um it's just it's a frustrating time. Uh but the project is is so huge and certainly bigger than I thought. Yeah, I I mean I, I like Tim's idea. Maybe we get a little group together over the next two weeks between now and the next meeting to come up with top three, top five, whatever it is of the, I mean, I think what we need to do right now is start trying to hit base hits, not trying to hit home run. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what we need because the home run is really, I mean, you just said it yourself. It's not going to happen. Out of time. It's not going to happen. Well, in, at least for 20. It's like the village district. If, if we could do nothing but just define the boundaries uh, and it's, even if we had to stick with a quarter acre zoning in there, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to die on that mail. That's mm -hmm. fine. You know, it's 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 okay. It, it's just, it's there, and then we can come back to it and fill it in, fill it in later. Uh, I was really scared that the historic commission part we wanted to put an overlay district forward in the in the downtown. No, they didn't. Oh. Well, I know they didn't. But I was worried that that's what their plan was because, you know, that's controversial enough alone. It, it kind of is the one thing you'd want to do at a town meeting and nothing else. Just put that forward and have that discussion and have it vote. Not a whole new zoning. Purpose. So to, to, Rob's, to Rob's point and your point, a few people get together, talk about what are the two, three, four things, um, and then whatever number one is, I think is the village, and you say, okay, what are the sub areas that you want to concentrate on, right? We we definitely want to increase the density where it makes sense. We need, mm -hmm. we need to draw the line and get we public need, support. Yeah. Right? And maybe that's maybe that's it for, for this next meeting. David? Uh, standing back and observing this, We've been around the circle with consultants and planning and, and, and grants for a long time. And I'm afraid that a good, at least a good bit of the upcoming report is going to end up on the shelf of a lot of others. Um, and what needs to be done, and I don't have the know how, you, how you're going to get to it, is because I'm going to follow the control of people in this room. Um, to look at the highest priorities um, for changes um, and make make those changes, write those changes, and bring them back for approval by the committee. Well, you, you, that, and then you've got to get public support. Well, then you'll right? have so and you then, do that quickly so you can get public support. Um, I, I, I think to, to your point, I agree with most of what you said. My only thing that I would add on to the sitting the, the consultant work sitting on the shelf is that we learned a tremendous amount. And these two guys that that we we talked to, uh, we may not like everything they said, but they were experts. 
and you ask them a question, they knew the answer, right? Uh, yeah. You know, even the, the learning about the conditional stuff uh, that, that we Yeah, there's five or six things in, in their stuff that I would absolutely right. support. So I would jump at Dota, what, like the R5 um, uh, generational thing, being done. Duplex in the R5. Mm -hmm. yeah. Done. Right. Triplex. Uh, so maybe quadplex. Who knows? Uh, but those are the things. But like drawing the line. I mean, drawing the line is going to be big. Anyways, I digress. Okay. Um, anything else? Because it's about. I just got everything. one thing, and it'll be quick. Believe okay, me, it'll Dave. be quick. I'd like to make a suggestion. We had a good thing with the lakeside people. If if the village district is what we're looking at. Let's can we get together and meeting with the people in the village district so we can get input now. Yeah. As to where yeah. we're heading and where they want to be and what they want to see. But before we do that, we've got to have something to present to them. Right. Right. We didn't so have maybe, anything at the lakeside. Really. We actually kind yeah. of got burned presenting stuff yeah. to the village district right. people. And they're like, what is this? You know, like, no, no, no. So what do we do? Go and you say, hey, what do you guys want? want? That's what we did with the lake people. Yeah. We did. We can't. Yeah, I, Although you know that kind of backfired too, because people were like, "Well, what do you want? You know, like, what are you asking for?" Remember, Dan Regan stood up and he's like, "This is what you're thinking about doing." We're like, "No, no, no, no." Right. You tell us what you want. I, I, I think a lake district is a little more self-contained, and some of the needs and solutions Very are similar. are much more obvious than looking at the at a village district. And I would be very hesitant to get together a, pe a, gr a, a group of people from the village and say to them, what do you want? Because it's just going to be a free for all. I think the way to go about it is to present them with one alternative or possibly two alternatives and say, or, or even more, pick, you know, Pick it apart. Tell us what's good about this. Tell us what you don't like about it. Oh, oh. Just as the people who were here two weeks ago did. did with our consultants' proposal that Maple and May would be part of the whole Route Four district. So that that's my feeling on it. Maybe we even get simple and say, "This is what we have today." Column one. Yeah. Column two. These are these are the areas that we think don't work. Right. We'll give us some options. Some options. options. And then yeah. and the third column is we could do this. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Maybe you do that. It maybe one of the options is we do absolutely nothing. And maybe well, they that, all say, yes, do that. That's what I'm afraid of, right? <laughs> that, what I'm afraid of is that, that and it's their right, right? They'll right. come back and say no change. Yeah. Which which is the worst thing that could happen because we obviously know there are changes that need to happen. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So we should um, maybe include that as part of the discussion of the three priorities or yep. save it. I'm going to write all this stuff down. No, just come up with this list. Whitney's doing it. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy hey, to set it up. Right? I mean, you're the secretary. I don't know. So, um, well, I should back. So, Jenny's name Tim, has Dana. been in front of Brad. I no, he just did that. I think he's leaving. <laughs> no, was I was getting ready to pack up. Um, would you like me to set something up in the next week or so to uh, get a few of us in the room? Yeah. But we got to be careful. We can't add more than four again in the room, or then it's a meeting. Three. So, if you, yeah, faults. Well, Seven voting members, so if you have three, it's not a quorum. Right. Four is a quorum. So it's going to be three people. Three you, people. Are you going three to members. be there? Yeah, I don't count. I'm not a member. <laughs> you count. Is that right? kind of alternates? Ah, yes. 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 Yeah. So, well, the, no, uh, an alternate would, unless he's elevated to a member, wouldn't count. No. I wouldn't. I wouldn't push that. Right <laughs> I'm yeah, trying. I'm trying. I mean, we actually had to warn this meeting as a joint meeting because they had a quorum of their members here. Heritage did. So it was, you know, got to. But Heritage doesn't warn meetings anyway. Yeah, they should. Oh, you do? No. Oh, it's. I don't want to. <laughs> 
Absolutely. Ninety one A. Absolutely. Everything okay. that the public does. Okay. So Rob, will you try Let's to set something up? Set something anybody up feeling over the really next strong? Week or I mean, so? We could do a couple of sessions and we could I'm mix back. I'm willing to pour into it. All right. Yeah, I, really right. Want to see I, mean, I think David has to be there too. Be thinking about what you Sorry. think your top well, in three, four things. Thanks, buddy. Voluntold. Voluntold. I've been voluntold. Yes. Voluntold. I like that. <laughs> All right. Uh, Brad, I make, I make Brad a whispered a motion in my ear. <laughs> Do I hear a second? All right. Uh, we got to do a roll call. All in favor? Oh, in favor of adjourning. Dan. Yes. Linda. Aye. Brad. Aye. Tim. Aye. Kurt. Aye. <laughs> Dan, Dan, yes. Bill, Bill. <laughs> so, Bill. Okay. Um, that's Kurt in front of him. I don't know. Yeah, that's that's what threw me. <laughs> and um, I'll vote to adjourn. No, I did. So, we are adjourned at 12 after 9. <laughs> <laughs>